And I will tell you that Georgia does not have the best open meetings laws in the nation, nor does it have the worst. But I would suggest to you, and it's something that, ha that Holly has already alluded to, that our presumption as citizens should always be a presumption of openness. Whether we're talking about records, we're talking about meetings, we're talking about things that people want to take in executive session, any resident, any citizen of the state of Georgia should always presume that everything that government does and every record that government holds is open, that it is public. There are exceptions, but the exceptions should not become the rule. And I would suggest to you that we have a culture in our state and in most of our communities where the exception has become the rule. And the onus should always be on government to justify the exception. In fact, they are required to. So sometimes when Holly gives you the legal opinion, you may not like it, but it is what the law says. And sometimes when we tell you the reality or the gravity of the situation that you're involved in, it may not be the satisfying, the emotionally satisfying answer, but it is the reality. I believe that there are tactics, tools, that we can put into place to create the right kinds of sensitivities and sensibilities in local officials. But it's not going to happen in a day. Hopefully, as we go around the state and do this with groups like you, we can create an army of people that are equipped with the right armaments to be able to help build that culture of openness where the expectation, not just of citizens, but of government at all levels can be that everything that government does, every piece of business that government does, and every document that government holds belongs to you. Okay, now Holly's going to talk about meetings. Uh, so we start from the same um, general uh, principle that the meetings of all government agencies are subject to public attendance. My favorite example is the school board. Um, but what others? I mean, what other common meetings are you guys having trouble getting into? Really? What county? What I suspect is that you're not having Sorry. trouble getting into the meetings is that you are having meeting the business is happening before and around the meetings and outside the meetings. Yeah. Yeah. So basically open meetings in Georgia is there is no federal equivalent to the Open Meetings Act. There's something called the Federal Advisory Committees Act, but I don't even know what that is. But there's no equivalent like FOIA is to the Open Records Act. But it says that the meetings of all public agencies uh, are subject to uh, attendance by citizens. I will point out that all the agencies covered by both the Open Records and Open Meetings Act is contained in the definitional section of the Open Meetings Act to a certain extent for your guiding principles you want to um, start with open meetings. But let's get down to the nuts and bolts. How do you know about a meeting? What's the concept? Notice. Three types of meetings in Georgia. One I wish we never had. Our regular meeting is the first type. In fact, in my office building in DeKalb County, uh, I think the Economic Development Authority meets in my building. So I have noticed that there is on the marquee always something that says for the regular meeting of the, down, of the Economic Development Authority, first Monday of every month at 6 p.m. in room 6. That is sufficient notice for a regular meeting. I don't say have much to say about a regular meeting unless somebody has complaints, but it is very simple to notice a regular meeting because typically it would always meet at the same time each month, each week, and there would be a standing notice and no requirements that there would be anything else. The bigger problem 
and the Open Meetings Act with notice is for your special meetings and then dread of dreads for this concept called emergency meetings, which I hate and I wish never existed and it's been a disaster and we'll talk about that in a second. Let's start with special meetings. What is a special meeting and what kind of notice does one need for a special meeting? Special meeting, as you know, something that comes up that needs to be addressed outside the contours of a regular meeting. They have to meet for some other reason. It happens all the time. What is the notice requirement? It's 24 hours in advance of the meeting. There also is a provision that the public agency needs to notify the local organ of the county when when that's happening the question you're about to ask me is what if the meetings on a Thursday and the public and the organ publishes on a Wednesday I know I've dealt with all these questions before I think we're out of luck um, 24 hours notice in advance of the special meeting um, I don't know that I have much more to say about that. I know that that issue is, and special meetings are rife with problems, particularly in Cobb and others, and we'll talk about that at length, I'm sure, during the afternoon. The third class of meeting is a terribly scary concept, and I hope that none of you in this room ever have to deal with it, an emergency meeting. That is a concept, the third tier of meeting, contemplated by the statute, it's OCGA 50-14-1, and it essentially gives free reign for the public agency to meet when it wants. The design and the reason for this meeting was not because the bond has come due. That's not an emergency. What the emergency was was a broken bridge, was a tornado. That is the only reason, and I suspect if we have a good case, I'll take it. Maybe, I don't quote me on this, maybe pro bono, because I hate this concept of an emergency meeting, and I think it's abused, and none of us in this room, the way the statute was written, should have ever deal with an emergency meeting. <coughs> essentially, there's no notice required, essentially. The, it, it, the, for these alleged emergency, the public agency can meet uh, Essentially, they just, what, what, is, is there even an hour requirement? I don't even remember. I don't think there is any requirement in the law. But it, it's, it should only be used for something like a bridge breaking when all the channels to the town uh, are uh, um, blocked or a tornado or a real emergency. And just about nothing um, um, qualifies. On a national level, the example that they give some of the scholars in this area is when there's an oil a leak that is infiltrating all the water and children are swimming in it. That's an example of when you use an emergency meeting. But just for your knowledge, notice is the concept why how we learn about public meetings in Georgia. Three types, your regular, which is notice on the marquee, your special, which is your 24-hour notice, and if you leave from, with nothing else today, you can remember that Holly hates emergency <laughs> meetings and think they are really uh, an abused thing under the law. All right, another thing happens in advance of a meeting in Georgia. It is called an agenda. When does an agenda have to be made available? Or as soon as possible. Up to two weeks. How about this for some great legal writing? I don't know why I didn't think to change this. This has been in since 2001, up to two weeks before. What does that mean in the law? <laughs> I mean, come on. Uh, yeah, sometime, but no but more than two weeks prior to the um, meeting. The point is, and, and I don't, unless you tell me otherwise, I don't know that um, public agencies, most of them are making the agenda available. The point is, there's nothing on the agenda. So I think that's the bigger issue with agendas. So in the two week period uh, prior to a meeting, an agenda needs to be available. Here's the problems that I'm aware of with agendas. You know, public agencies put them together, but what is on them? Um, I, um, you know, there's always, um, is it adequate to have a standing closed session on it? 
I think no, but I know it's on every agenda. And I think in a litigation, frankly, I would lose that one. We would lose that one. But I know a lot of counties have a standing closed session on for personnel matters or litigation or what have you. Um, here's the key, the only litigatable point. And litigatable means something that's got teeth when you go into court. What happens if something comes up during the meeting that is not on the agenda? Can, how many, back to my hands, how many people think that the commission can discuss something if it was not on the agenda? How, how many, well I know they do. But, um, how many think you can't? Yeah, I mean, here, here's what the law says. It's in some of the reported cases. It says if an, uh, agenda item that beco it is, becomes necessary during the course of a meeting to discuss, then it's permissible. Of course, you and I both know that, what does that mean? And it happens all the time, but there was some effort in the statute to try to put some caps on that, to try to make it a real working agenda. It's quite obvious if your property is gonna be condemned and it's not on the agenda and somehow the uh, official, the agency brings it up and it condemns your property and you didn't know about the meeting so you weren't there, that's a problem, but that's the whole point of agendas um, prior to meetings. So in advance of the meeting, again, sorry to repeat, the notice concept, the agenda concept, so we get to the meeting. We discuss, they discuss, whatever they want. I'll ask you something that I would say may rank as the number one question I get in the office. Do you, do I as a citizen, have a right to speak at the meeting? No. 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 Anybody think a um, citizen has a right to speak at the meeting? Only if it's a public hearing. Any other thoughts on that? You can get up and call them out if you know they're breaking the law and has to be put on the record, can't you? If you know uh, they're doing a protocol or doing something. Yeah, I, just, I, I, I would love to say yes. I just don't want you to get arrested. And then, <laughs> then uh, somebody, my board will fire me, and then I can retire, really. But no, uh, yes, within limits, you do want to call your council or your commission. But yeah, I mean, it's a great question about the ability of the citizen to speak at a public meeting. It happens not to be at all mentioned in the Open Meetings Act. It's a pure First Amendment right. And what I mean about that, it's a speech right under the Georgia and federal constitution. <coughs> the idea that we are allowed to speak. But the Open Meetings Act governs the actions and the speech and the procedures for the public officials, not for us. I will say that if you are grappling with that, because that comes up quite frequently, what a public agency has to do is equal time for both positions. It, there's got to be some kind of equity in terms of you can't let everybody for the condemnation speak and people not against. There's got to be some equity, the same amount of time, both positions, equal speech. I know, cop, cop, cop. But again, it's not really an open meetings concept, but I started bringing it up in my talks because it, it, I, I get calls, I'd say at least one a week, about do I have a right to speak at my public meeting. Yeah, hours generally have, if you sign up beforehand, you have three minutes, whatever. I think that's fairly pervasive. There, there. And how do they handle it if uh, like hundreds of people want to speak for three minutes? Or I, how I think they arbitrarily draw a line. We yeah. limit hours at 30 minutes. Yeah, I mean, anyway, it's an interesting question, but again, it's not an open meetings question, but obviously it relates to, in the way that, let me digress for a second, records retention, which I didn't touch on, meaning how long a public agency needs to keep its records. It's an analogous or a, a concept that's tied to open records. This idea of public a citizen speech at a public meeting is kind of tied to um, open meetings. All right, <coughs> you're going along listening or listening to nothing or something substantive, depending on what they're talking about. All of a sudden, out of the blue, like as if we've never heard of it, this concept of a closed session. David Hudson once taught me the most important thing ever. I love it. He doesn't like to call them executive sessions. Right. Why? It makes them feel too important. <laughs> closed <laughs> sessions, not executive. I actually kind of like that from a uh, granola 
uh, roots um, protest kind of thing. What is the most, no, I'm not one of those, well, I was when I was younger. Um, one of those lawyers. Um, what has to happen, most important concept in the Open Meetings Act, has to happen before a closed session? They must vote to go into it. They must vote to go into closed session. I'm going to repeat. This is the number one reason you can hang up a public official, public agency, and get the action set aside that takes place to figure out what happens inside a closed session. The public agency must <laughs> vote in public while we are sitting there. Not before, not after. A vote must. It's mandatory. I'm seeing from the smiles that it's not happening. It <laughs> must happen, and if you want to sue your public agency, call me up. I'll send you a complaint, because that is the number one reason that I don't even understand how public this can do that wrong. It's don't do the law right after the meeting, ma'am. So, yeah. Um, anyway, most important concept in the Open Meetings Act, the idea of a public vote to withdraw into closed session. All right. The reasons for closed session I'll come back to just like I did for the, the exceptions for, um, we did for open records. As Jim pointed out very appropriately, the, and this is great, uh, anybody remember uh, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Norman Fletcher, he wrote a great opinion that I've never seen this done. Um, if there is any doubt in terms of closing a meeting, do not close, it's in capital letters, it's a really nice opinion. The rule of thumb, just like um, every over, all records are open, the idea is, <laughs> which I know, that's where you do it, that didn't happen. Um, um, closure of meetings should be limited and it should be narrow and just done for a very finite number of reasons. I will tell you in the code section also, take a look at this because um, I've got the open meetings law written. There's less reasons for closure. Um, in the Open Meetings Act that there are exceptions in the Open Records Act, but I also know that that um, is abused. All right, let's say the vote happens. You and I are having our coffee waiting for them to come out of closed session. Let's talk about a cross-check. Um, how do you know what happens in closed session? And I'm gonna give Jennifer Farmer and the Georgia Press Association the biggest compliment in the world the Georgia Press Association, years and years ago, even before my time, tried to get put in the law this idea of recording what happened in closed session. That was a really important thing. What happened in 2001, though, was nothing was happening in the law. We had no way to cross-check what happened in um, a closed session. This concept of an affidavit came around in 2001. An affidavit signed by the chairperson of the meeting, sort of a checklist of what was discussed during closed session. This affidavit is supposed to be filed with the minutes of the, um, of the uh, meeting afterwards, and essentially, is supposed to say whether or not the, camp, the commission in closed session talked about personnel matters, whether it talked about pending litigation, whether it talked about acquisition of real estate. It was a checklist. That quickly devolved into a disaster, even though it still remains on the books. Some of the commissioners and public agency members did not trust one another. So that, was, that affidavit was, is supposed to be signed under penalty of perjury. Um, and um, <laughs> what happened in some cases, some of the public agency members uh, or some of the public agency had every member of the commission sign it because they didn't trust each other that much. <laughs> I will say this, that um, it was something. Um, it, was, um, it was a start as to what happened in closed session. Um, it wasn't... Um, you tell me. I, um, I would say that it was an <coughs> inadequate um, um, tool, but it was something. So 
what the idea of what's supposed to happen is after the closed session happens, this affidavit is supposed to be signed, and when the minutes, which I'll come to in a second, are prepared um, and filed wherever they're filed, this affidavit of what was discussed during closed session is supposed to be filed with the minutes. How though do you know that that was what was discussed? I mean, I asked you as a practical matter. How do you know? Well, I'll tell them real quick something that happened last year in Clayton County. They went into a two-hour executive session. Uh, the chairman and all the council members came back out in, in front, standing in front of the, the commission table. And uh, the chairman, and this is exactly, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, this is exactly what was said. I'm not like leaving anything out. He said, I will entertain a motion. And one member of the council said, I make a motion to do what we discussed in executive session. The other one said, I second. And it passed unanimously. Yeah. And it, it's it's not that is not uncommon. You know, y'all heard it too. It's not uncommon at all. And if there is one part of the act that I believe is more abused than anything else, mm -hmm. it's the executive session privilege. And we'll talk more about that uh, today. And in, in a, uh, the segment that I cover in just a few minutes, we'll talk a little bit about executive session and how it is abused across the state. Um. So after this, um, after the public meeting, the idea is minutes um, to be filed. I would say in Georgia, um, and I have not looked at other states to see what they do, but the minutes um, need to record the number of the members of the public agency there, how they voted, the major pieces of um, business that was transpired, and along with the minutes, that are filed, wherever they are filed, this affidavit uh, of what happened during closed session is supposed to be filed. However, Jim makes a good point. Votes. Even today, post the 2012 law, which I'll admit to you has confused me more than, but I'm confused by some of the 2012 changes to the open meetings law. They don't make sense to me. In a pragmatic way. So I don't understand why we're saying they're more clear. They've confused me more. But I believe what still stands is that when a agency comes out of closed session, any votes, although it's unclear if they have to say what it is they're voting about, they have to vote in public. And that's a rule of thumb when I have taught this subject matter over the years. If you remember nothing else, um, you remember that they have to vote to go into closed session. But any substantive votes, even if we don't know what they're about, always have to be done in open session. So remember that. They're going to get in trouble, as Jim points out, if they vote inside a closed session. Now, Matthew Cardinale, in his case of, um, against the city of Atlanta, tried to um, really get some specificity on what needed to be recorded, what a unanimous vote meant, as opposed to uh, a roll call vote. We could go into some specifics, but I would urge you to hold them to the concept of voting in public. Let me move on to two more subject matters, and then we can sort of come back to any questions uh, you may have for um, um, uh, we can talk about them afterwards. Can a board meet by telephone? The law used to be that only agencies with statewide jurisdiction could do that, meaning the State Board of Transportation, the Natural Resources Board. Unfortunately, I think, um, that now uh, in emergency circumstances, usually for an emergency, you see why I hate that word so much, now a, a, a commission can do it only once. Uh, th there's a limit on it, but it can't happen so long as there is access, in other words, a call-in number for anybody who wants to um, participate. I am hoping that local municipalities and counties have enough ego involved that they want to be seen and posture and have things um, in, in person, but it is in the law now, so be aware of that, that um, some of these local commissions can at least once during the year uh, meet by telephone, so long as there is access made available for um, all citizens. How would you know if it's an emergency? 
You're not going to know anything about an emergency meeting. That's the problem. So how do you have access? So, well, I, I can't. A lot doesn't go into it so much on whether it's telephone meetings for just as a meeting once a year. I, I don't know. So let's not publicize that um, <coughs> telephone meetings are a possibility. <laughs> let's keep it amongst ourselves and hope that the county attorneys okay. are never uh, happy to see me um, don't notice it. All right, we'll talk about a couple of things that, um, again, confused me terribly. What are the exceptions to withdrawing to closed session? Well, all these crazy ones now are in it. You know, um, going to training, like here. Now, um, that's not a public meeting. I realize that it wasn't practical, but the County Commissioners Association and the Georgia Municipal Association lobbied for the idea that when they all go to county training, county commissioner training, that's not a meeting. When they go to a retreat, that's not a meeting. The old, um, the old law used to be okay. It used to be, in my opinion, it was better because the only thing we talked, about, we talked a lot about perception. If we're all going to my wedding and they're all there because we're celebrating my wedding, that's obviously not a meeting because a meeting is something. And I, I, I'm sorry, I'm out of order. You can tell I'm a little bit tired. A meeting is defined as. A, pre-established, pre-defined to talk about subjects. If we're going to my wedding, obviously let's hope that I'm, there isn't any reason that my wedding needs to be public. But the perception of them all sitting at the same table and such, that would be the problem. So the issue in open meetings used to be, what well, was a meeting going to dinner before or after a, um, a commission meeting? Was that a meeting? But now, I don't, this is why I don't like the new open meetings. Like, there's all these weird new exceptions in it. This training thing, riding in a car together, and I realized that Jim and the Valdosta Times weren't going to get in the van, or maybe you were, to ride with them to train. But all these weird exceptions that basically make it clear that these things aren't meetings. I thought from a public citizen perspective, it's better the way it was. In any case, there's a whole bunch of new <coughs> exceptions in the Open Meetings Act that do not allow public access two things and the, the retreats is a big thing and training so keep that in mind we'll see how that shakes out over the next um, few years I don't as a practical matter know when we're going to get a chance to go back to the General Assembly to change this law um, in some ways we don't want to because the problem with um, leg legislating open government acts is it can always get worse but that, that's a policy discussion for another time. <coughs> Remedies on open meetings. Um, as bad as for open um, records, the same ones available. But I need help from you all because I can't remember now. I believe the law used to be if you filed a lawsuit within 90 days of the alleged bad action and you won, you can set it aside. I believe. That is up to six months now. Is that correct in the law? Does anybody? I, I think it's told based on the time that you were known about it. Mm -hmm. um, that, the time that, that you should have known about well, it. Well, that, okay, that may, I need to check that, but I believe the time limit is also now, there's a more, re, that, that was an improvement, a more realistic time frame, six, it, it's impossible to figure out whether it would, you, you could put something in three months, no way. So that has expanded. But the same remedies um, in, um, for the open meetings as open records, the superior court litigation, which isn't practical or efficient, the criminal penalties, which are virtually never used, Stefan Ritter in the Attorney General's office, me and Jim um, writing on the, um, news media about these things. <clears throat> I will say that um, I have had more complaints over my career in this uh, arena in open records as opposed to open meetings. But I will say the discussions about House Bill 397 in 2012, which led to the new existing open government laws, most people at the table disagreed with me. They believed that open meetings had more problems but I have always had a history of having more open records problems and complaints brought to my attention than meetings complaints. Um, what else? Well, I wanna, we're going to talk a, a lot about um, kind of the frustrations I think that a lot of us feel on the, on the local level. And a lot of those do center around meetings and <coughs> center around executive session. Thomas Jefferson 
called information the currency of democracy. And I will tell you something that is preferable over litigation, something that is preferable over transparency projects, over the First Amendment Foundation, over the AG's office, and over going to the DA, which by the way is a waste of your time. Local DAs are never going to prosecute anything to do with open government or open meetings. They won't even talk to you about it. They will always refer to the AG, and I've even had the AG's office say, have you talked to your DA? Uh, and it, it, it's a dog chasing its tail. But I'll tell you something that's preferable to all of those remedies, and that is government just being open. We need to understand that it is incumbent upon a citizen to realize that it is their government. And the only way that government can be of, by, and for the people is if it is before the people. This is not about us versus them. It's about us versus us. Because government, we are a self-governed people. That's the way our form of government, that's where our constitutional republic works. It's the way that we have got to make it work. While uh, Thomas Jefferson also said that if he had to uh, you know, choose between a government without newspapers or the media, or he had to choose the media without government, he would take newspapers and the media over government. But he also said that these principles of openness and transparency aren't about newspapers. It's not about the media. It is not the responsibility of the media. It's the responsibility of all of us. So let me do this really quickly. Uh, show me if you're a member of the media, if you're newspaper, print, radio, TV, whatever. So we have a lot of folks here that, that are media folks. And if you are a part of, say, a citizen action committee, a calls group, um, a watchdog group in your communities, and that is, a, that is a good percentage of you. And if you are either employed by government or elected to office, and first of all, for everybody else in the room that did not raise your hand on this one, give these public officials a round of applause. To you. And you the of what we have got to get the dialogue away from us fighting government and make government realize that they are us. And I do believe that in every hall of government, on every city council, in every county commission, in every office in Canyon City government, there are good people who want to do the right thing. I believe there is misinformation. I believe that sometimes there is a sort of a misguided concept. And I also believe that there is a level of corruption that exists. The problem is we want to paint a very broad stroke and assume that every time we get frustrated by government that it's corrupt. And it may not be corrupt. It may just be wrong. It may just be mistaken. It may be that the government just doesn't understand something. There are a few things that I at least want you to take away today. And there are some things that I think that are going to be real important as we resonate the message back to our communities. And for those of you that are at newspapers or working in the media, or those who has a blog or a website, for those of you that have blogs and websites, for those of you uh, that buy ink by the barrel and uh, work at newspapers or any other media, let me tell you something. If we are not doing open government advocacy, we have sold our soul and we're not doing our jobs. And for those that believe somehow that it is a conflict of interest for newspapers and, and, and other media to do open government ad advocacy, you just don't get it. This is not about us. It's about representing the values of freedom. And if we don't stand up for the First Amendment and stand up for, first, uh, for open government, we totally misunderstood our role as the fourth estate. And that role not, is not just an important legacy and historical role. It is part and parcel of freedom. And I, I think that we have a pulpit 
we have a voice. We have an opportunity every single time that we go to print or every single time we update our sites to be able to send a strong message to our community, to government officials, to those that are elected, to those that are working for government, and to just everyday men and women, to folks, that government belongs to the governed and not to the governing. So the first takeaway that I want you to have is, first of all, when it comes to, and I, I, I agree with Holly or, or David or whoever said, that it's not executive session. And you know what? We had another word for it when I was growing up. Instead of closed meeting, we called it backdoor deal making. <laughs> and I want you to understand that there is no requirement in the law for backdoor deal making. There is no requirement in the law for executive session. And that is one of the biggest misnomers by local officials. A couple of years ago, a reporter that was working for me went up to a chairman of the Board of Education and said, ma'am, can you tell me why y'all were in executive session for two hours? And the reporter sat there for two hours because she knew she'd be in trouble with me if she had left. Sat there for two hours waiting on them to come out of executive session. Do you know what citizens did during that two hours? They started dropping like flies. They started leaving one right after. It happens every month, doesn't it? So the reporter sat there and sat there and sat there until she was sitting there alone. Except maybe I think there were a couple of spouses in the room. And so she goes up and she says, ma'am, can you tell me why you are in executive session for two hours? And here was the answer. We were required to. We had a personnel item, and we were required to. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no requirement in the law to go into executive session for personnel. There is no requirement in the law to go into executive session for real estate. There is no requirement in the law to go into executive session for litigation. There is an allowance. There is an exception. There is a provision, but there is no requirement. So that every single time, every time, local officials